Welcome to Spiritual Studies Session 68. This is a familiarization and acquaintance with Tengrism. Tengrism is a center of various beliefs, yet also is conglomerated through various beliefs of Central Asia moving into ancient Eastern Europe. Accordingly, there is a pronunciation warning. I have studied, to some extent, uh, how to speak some of these things, but there are many ways of saying. And there are also many different versions and many different stories. It's a lot more fluid than some might be used to when it comes to studying religions. Accordingly, Tengrism is difficult to pin in regards to what category. Some might argue it's monotheistic, another might argue that it's polytheistic, and then there are those that are quick to point out shamanistic and animistic inclinations. We will be going through all of that. This was the prevailing religion of the Turks, the Mongols, the Hungarians, the Bulgars, Huns, and so forth. This was a centered religion in the ancient world and continues to this day. Now, this movement as well, <clears throat> you can say across the ancient world, was from um, the root of Siberian shamanism as it became centered and moved through the step of Central Asia all the way through what we call mo modern Russia and continued into Eastern Europe was the initiating religion of the Bulgars and early Hungarians, as mentioned. Tengri means blue sky in Mongolian. The eternal blue sky is something to pray to. The land, Mongolia itself, called the land of the eternal blue sky. In Turkish, this is Gok Tanri, sky god, Tengri, as it's otherwise said, which I will be using throughout the expanse of this video. The religion of the Hungarians, until the 10th century, and thus Christianity steps in. We also see certain implications in Crimea. There is all sorts of reference to this across the ancient world, going to the Persians. Tengrism is an afterword, in the sense that this wasn't what it was called until fairly recently, in comparison to how old the religion is. Tengrism is a source of convenience because Tengri is the center of the religion or the default, the monotheistic, um, I don't know if ruler is the best word, but we'll say that. Among uh, the Turkic people, when it comes to Turkey proper, right? Now, uh, that was supplanted by Islam. So when I'm mentioning their beliefs throughout this, this is ancient beliefs, not what is currently practiced. Although you will see practices of Tengrism synchronistically within, say, the Tatars, within, say, Turkey, um, within other places in Eastern Europe or in um, the greater Central Asia to Eurasia, uh, of Tengrism, within uh, what might otherwise be practiced as Islam or Christianity. So this is a kind of root source. And again, it's not over. Tengrism is still happening. It's happening in Mongolia. Um, and, as we'll touch on towards the end, is resurfacing in a substantial way. Now, when it comes to literary sources, this is always a bit tricky, especially when we're talking about any religion that isn't, say, like Hindu, Buddhist, or Abrahamic. Now, there are the Orkhan inscriptions, there is the secret history of the Mongols, and the Altan Topchi, which all these sources aren't necessarily 
um, accounts of the religion itself. These are more accounts that include a great amount of other information, history, so forth, that just so happens to also mention stories that can be kind of reverse engineered to understand the uh, religion of Tengrism. Now, this reference to source as well, uh, we have a story, Gezer, or Jezer, I'm not sure which one, the epic of King Jezer. And this is the longest epic in the world, as it said, created or dated, you know, to be put into print at least by the 12th century. There are over a million verses, and it's 80 hours long of oration. So this is that old-style epic. Many don't know, but if you, you know, read the Odyssey, this was something to say out loud. This wasn't something to write down and to study for university. <laughs> this was storytelling, and this is the way of our past. Verbal, ceremonious storytelling. And when this story would be told, it was to be accompanied with a fiddle. And this is a Central Asian story. This expands all the way through. This isn't uniquely Tengrism, but Tengrism holds Gezer, I, again, I'm not sure, or Jezer, as a kind of cultural hero of Tengrism. So there are some sort of sources that help inform this from a more literary, archaeological, so forth, standard. <clears throat> So, as it was introduced in the Eastern world, or as it's familiar with the, uh, the mainstream context of the Western world, there are these accounts written by the Persians and the Arabs giving, you know, breath to Tengrism. There are these accounts of the early Middle Ages of attempting to supplant Tengrism as it was brought by the Mongolian invasions. Each individual place with its own accounts. Again, Crimea is another. Depending on what time these beliefs were supplanted by other beliefs. The modern movement of Tengrism is a reclaiming of the nature-centric philosophy. That which is popularizing around the world. I've talked about it several times in the course, the reclaiming of neo-paganism in Europe or um, so forth is not just an identity of one's culture and ancestral history, but also a seeking of a better, more healthy temperance with the earth. And in Tengrism, by extension, it preaches or shows or displays or accommodates a living in harmony with the natural universe. It prioritizes this. That everything is sustained by the celestial blue sky, Tengri, the fertile mother goddess, which we'll get to, and the life spirit. The heaven, the earth, and the spirits of nature, i.e. ancestors, are here to give you everything you need and to protect you. You are not in a lawless prison. <laughs> crazy, crazy thought. So living an upright life, living in balance, encourages, invites, and solicits well-being, prosperity, and the things that you need to go well. And accordingly, in helping to maintain this balance, the shamans are present. This isn't a religion, right? I'm going to use that in asterisks. Uh, religion that is a linchpin on the shamans. The shamans are there to help maintain the ethic. But they are not 
epitomized. They are not like priests. So as mentioned, let's get more into Tengri. God of the blue sky. This you can think of right away as relating to all manner of sky fathers, whether it's Zeus, Odin, Dagda, so forth. It immediately more conjured Anu for me, which is the Babylonian extending back into the Sumerian. Sky Father remains the center of the religion, practiced religion, in the center of its shamanism, the center of its ancestral worship. The Heavenly Father created all things, Father to all, leader of all gods yet is not anthropomorphized and is totally unknowable and infinite. <laughs> okay, so we're setting the grounds here. Those that would come to rule, those that would become leaders, were thought to have been ordained or approved of by Tengri. So, to become a leader is to become an extension of Tengri. There is also a form, Daichi Tengri, the red god of war. So, this is a form of Tengri, one of many, one of many. And this would be the form that would be sacrificed to in order to solicit favor in battle. Now, when it comes to <laughs> another version, in the creation story, there is a version of Tengri that is a pure white goose that flies endlessly over the expanse of the waters. See, there it is. Nun, Absu, face that shone on the waters of the deep. Water, again, to reiterate, represents time. This has always been the case in ancient stories. Water is time. And from the waters, the white mother, Akana, calls out, create, to Tengri. And he's lonely. He's lonely in this expanse. So he does. He creates. In this version, there is another. This is Erkishi. And he becomes a sort of counter to Tengri. Erkishi wants to mislead people, draw them into the darkness. We'll be touching a bit more on this later. The Ak Tengris, this particular form of Tengri occupies the fifth level of heaven. And <laughs> there are many levels to heaven. The shamanic priests can reach, but never reach the highest. But humans cannot occupy these heavenly layers. So there are times, too, where this version of Tengri reproaches the earth in the shape of a goose-shaped vessel. Now that's interesting. I, when I was first reading this, my mind immediately went to the gourds, as it was with the Taino people. The gourds of heaven. Because if you think about it, a goose does quite look like a gourd. <laughs> In the Tengrist universe, there are three levels. Again, it's on the shamanic, so this is exactly like the shamanic. There is the upper world, the lower world, and the mid world, and we occupy the mid world. The upper tends to resonate with the idea of a spiritual world, and the lower, in this case, I think has taken on quite a bit of attributes from its neighbors. Um, a darker story. The, the one thing, the one thing that unifies all these three realms is the sacred tree. 
the sacred tree, the tree of life, the world tree, Yidrasil, whatever you wish to call it. This is ancient, ancient, ancient. And you might think about this unification as, as above, so below, in the sense that the fractal form, if you look out in the stars and you see the uh, nebula, or if you look into your arm and you see how your veins course out, and you look out and you see the river, how it courses out into estuaries, into deltas, and it all looks like this pattern. This unification of pattern, this fractal form, is the limbs of the tree. The tree as it exists, this pattern as it exists, on all levels of micro to macro cosmic. So there's that, there's that context. I really think that should be minded to understand. Now, when it comes to the interpretation of Earth, or Yur, as the ancient Turks called it, I believe, I believe that's true, Earth is an extension of sky, and the two are complementing and have the same beginning. Even though the Earth is deified differently, it is still Tengri, because it all comes from Tengri. So you can see the slope of the monotheistic, polytheistic mishmash here. Because while the other deifications exist, which we'll be getting to later, they are all Tengri. So man was born of the earth, came from its shell, and was distinct because Tengri gave it soul, right? Breathed air into it. Same kind of thing. And takes the soul back when they die, you see. So the gift of the soul is what makes humans unique. So Tengri, father, your mother, nature, mother, earth, mother. Tengri, supreme, you're a part of Tengri. So, <clears throat> the cosmology variates as well, because if we're talking about the ancient Turks, then there are 17 deities who rule the universe. Tengri, Yur, Umai, Erlik, Earth, Water, Fire, Sun, Moon, Star, Air, Clouds, Wind, Storm, Thunder, Lightning, Rain, Rainbow. Bam, 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 bam. And you can see right away, there's only so many... Haughty names, right? These are all literally things <laughs> that exist, that are observable phenomena. <laughs> Whereas in the Mongolian cosmology, there are 99, a group of 99 deities that, again, are extensions of Tengri, but still. Now, Tengri as a name variates substantially as it moves across these languages as well. Tengri, Tengeri, Tengara, Tengeri. So this word, as it variates, can also be found in the Chinese Tian, which is T-I-A-N, which is the sky, heaven, God, father, predominance in the Zhao dynasty. So this, this um, Tanri, as a generic form as well, is used still to this day, in Turkish. So there's a lot of consequentialness that moves from this belief, you see. There's a lot more going on there than one might expect, which we saw plenty when we were studying the Siberian shamanism as well. So, everything was created by this initial creator, but with fairness. And the rewards and punishments come from this fairness. This is not a ruler, right? This isn't a dictator. And we'll see there's a lot more human, there's a lot more of a human side that plays with Tengri in a bit. But again, as well, I want to reiterate, while this one was not visualized, anthropomorphized, Tengri did produce many sons. Some versions too, most popularly too, I believe. 
as time moves forward, we see that the worship of Tengri in particular is rather simple. Yes, there are ceremonious uh, sacrifices that are made and have historically been made, but simply speaking, it is lifting the hands upward and bowing low. Classic. It's the sky. So I mentioned parts of one creation story already, but there is no unified creation story as we see when we dig back into ancient beliefs. There is many different stories that don't necessarily contradict each other, but they don't mesh completely. And it's always about feeling what is the interplay of these different stories, I think is how to best streamline. So when mentioning Tengri and this companion Kishi, they were together at the beginning of time in flying above the primordial deep, the waters. Kishi, though, wanted to outdo Tengri and tried to outfly, fly higher than Tengri. And this arrogance made him lose control and fell into the sea. He calls out to Tengri to save him. And Tengri summons, brings up land, earth, from the sea to create a mound to stand upon. And this is more abstract than it sounds. Because again, the waters are time. So what does land represent here, right? Foundation, foundation. In this mound grew the cosmic tree the cosmic tree of life, and its branches emerged on all levels and is always guarded. Tengri would go on to live in harmony with Yur, Earth Spirit. Some stories show marriage between the two. This marriage, this union, led to the creation of man. Yur gives the body, Tengri gives a soul. In another version, this was the one mentioned, Tangri, Karahan, many names, many versions, neither male nor female, pure white goose <laughs> over the waters, over time, is called out by Akana, which is the spirit of water, which is also there. The spirit of time, fates. This Akana reminds me of Ananke, which is the Orphic um, progenitor, the Holy Mother, primordial creator goddess, Akana. Water, interesting, we'll do a little side tangent. Water was created before the earth by this belief. Water was present before the earth. Water precedes the earth. Water was brought here, which we've covered before in the course. It's that panspermismos um, idea where everything that's here was brought here. This is all exported or imported, I should say, here from elsewhere. Therefore, she, Akana, is the elder sister to the earth. The beginnings of earth emanate from the water and from the waters. But as mentioned, there is a calling out from Akana to create, tells Tengri, create. Tengri, or Karahan as it is in this story, becomes anxious. This, this anxiety, which again, this is fascinating because we're seeing this creator deity is capable of anxiety. That's humanizing. Because this has been forever. Loneliness. Fear. In the endless expanse. It's create, create, create. What? Create what? How does he know what to create? This is quite the task, right? What do I do? The water becomes turbulent in this anxiety. And there's a need of a reassurance. And in this reassurance, 
comes the land rising from the deep. And from this creation, a nine-bowed tree of life branches extending all directions, ancestors of the humans, the nine races, the nine clans. That goes down, more story to, to, to be told there. And another version of this story too, that land rising comes from the act of a sacred duck. <laughs> I love that. Lura. This is called lifting the sand, clay, silt from the bottoms. And this, this is reminiscent of a few stories, as I've told both of these, but it's reminiscent of the diver myth, which we saw in Slavic paganism, which again is related here, um, or at least was touched by the same influences historically as here, to send someone to dive into the waters, something to do with falling into the waters, one falling into the waters, or the uh, good brother and the bad brother. We saw that with, was it Chernobog and some other and a Slavic story? Or when one is sent in, a human at times is sent into the water to grab the clay, and to grab soil from underneath the waters in order to bring it up to create land. And um, oftentimes, whoever dives in tries to hide some in their mouth. But it's just to say, these stories are very synchronistic. Very synchronistic. So here's a ceremony. A ceremony to Tengri. This ceremony reconstructs the cosmos, honors the cosmos as it was in these stories. This ceremony, this observed ceremony, was conducted in early spring morning on top of a mountain between four sacred birch trees and with a large fire to the east of them. This fire immediately is representative of the sun. I'm going to say the four birch trees are representative of the cardinal directions. Early morning, eastern direction, representing the beginning of the universe. The beginning of space and time. So, the participants walk towards the direction of the sun. They walk towards the east. They walk towards this fire. Invoke the name of each mountain and each river and each thing that they want to call into the universe. As if it's being recreated, you see. Since it's spring, this is the beginning. The winter was death. It's officially over. And now is the time to re-invoke what we want to create in our macrocosm, in our microcosm. This ceremonial ground is set in all the ways of creation. They tie a rope to the easternmost tree, and they stretch this rope around, tying it all the way around to the westernmost tree. And they create a boundary between these trees. This boundary is their world. Representative of their world. And in this case, the shaman is not giving the words. An elder is giving the words. They bring forth wine and this beverage. They circle the trees three times. They circle it. And then they lead the lambs. They spill the wine and milk on the trees. All directions. All directions. Give gifts. Show respect. Give sacred things. Lambs are sacrificed. Cooked. Cheese. Wine. Milk. Meat. Tossed to each of the trees, feed the directions, provide the anchors of our world, and speak. Sacred is the birch with nine leaves, Tengri. Nine lambs we offer up, Tengri. We ask for a rain, Tengri. We ask for a crop, Tengri. Let life be prosperous, Tengri. Sky, 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 sky father, sky father. Blue, eternal blue sky. And prayers over. Descend the mountain. 
Earth, universe, created, respect, given, acknowledgement of the beginning. So, let's get into some tenets of this belief as, as this, you know, fluid story that I'm giving goes forward. Of course, I've acknowledged there are variations to this belief system. But here are some centers. Tengri is beyond all nature. And all of nature is controlled or facilitated by Tengri. There are many different spirits within this, good and bad. They reside in the heavens, in the earth, in the underworld, and they can do harm. And we'll talk about that later. There is no true religion in the world. A man can be of any faith. This is the syncretism of Tengrism. We can't know Tengri. It's infinite, unknowable. There's so much to say that there is no true religion because of this. Fascinating. <laughs> Quite the contrast. And by extension of that, all humans were created with shortcomings. Nothing will measure up to Tengri. There should be tolerance for people. No one is perfect. And the, and the creator knows this. Of course the creator knows this. So look at that contrast. Now I want to point out some, something here, right? The function of the oppressive deity was political and was based off of uh, the, the, the horrible growth of civilization. This is the Mongolian steppe. This is the Siberian stretch. This is not some approaching industrial uh, Western European civilization. They don't need to suppress the burgeoning amount of population. And the function of creating a religion with a carrot stick, go to heaven, don't act right, go to hell, right? Papacy, all that, the function of that sort of lean, is political. It serves a political purpose. Here, we don't see that. Why? It's no game. Everything, humans are made with shortcomings. You'll be faulty. There are bad spirits around. You're faulty. Yeah, it's fine. You can believe whatever you want to believe. This is infinite, man. <laughs> Gosh. All right. The sun and moon have their own deification. But again, we already know. We already know the rules here. But extensions in the story. Worship the power and the vital force of the sun. Rituals on sunrise. Of course, the ascending sun. Bowing to the ascending sun. Solar rays as thought of as a medium for transmitting life from the sky, from the heavens, to man. The sun as an intermediary between Tengri and the earth, or mankind. And the moon as the daughter of the earth and Tengri. And that's fascinating, right? The celestial sky, Uranus, what have you, and the earth, the daughter is the moon. There are some uh, theories in science that there were, in the early cosmos, the Earth was more of a super-Earth, and there was a collision, and this collision broke a piece off, and that piece that broke off became the moon, and the bigger chunk, which is the Earth, rounded out and became Earth. The moon, though, has some plus and minus, some love and some fearful uh, attributes. The lady of the night uh, offers, you know, the entry of malicious spirits. They were said to emerge from the holes in the moon, and of course the witches, with their intentions, would pull upon its power to conduct 
ill acts at times. But of course, this magic force is not plainly bad. This magic could just as easily be solitude, serenity, uh, visions, and uh, benevolence. If a child was born during the full moon, the child would be named some form of the word for moon in respect to its being. And of course, the moon is associated with birth and fertility, so that's double. A story, to move on, to start talking about fire. There's a story of the fire prayer. It's implied that the heaven and the earth were once one, but this was a separation. A separation happened, which again mentioned, you know, could come how the earth, how the moon was made. This separation, which by collision, what have you, gave birth to fire, od as they call it. So the separation of the heaven and the earth birthed fire. The separation also made life on earth possible. Life came into being from the separation through the rains of the heavens. And again, there it is again, panspermismos. Things coming from the heavens that populate the earth. We could think of this as literal rain, but mm, there might be something more cosmological there. So life variates from this insemination. And the reason, that is the reason why the sky or the heavens is associated with the father and the earth is associated with the mother, right? The father sent the insemination and the earth received it and, and, and grew it and facilitated it, gave a home to it. That is, that is the old way, the old thought. And we still say it, Mother Nature, Sky Father. But fire, fire came from this birth. Fire came from this growth and development. It was before the development. And the ancient, the ancient uh, depictions of this deity of fire was a red cow or a red rooster or a red bull. Fire was also personified as female, Utana, mother fire, believed to be the mother of all people. When fire, fire would be this um, sacred part of the dwelling. The yurt or the home is this microcosm of the universe, again, representing the whole universe in a yurt. And what's in the center of this universe? The fire. The fire. And each family would have their own fire, and they would keep their own fire. And nobody well, that wasn't the family would be allowed to mess with this fire in any way or to take from this fire. This is the family fire. This is their, the family, their solar system. So you keep it there. You guard it there. You keep it going. You keep the fire going. And so depending on which tribe or which culture we're talking about, there were different ways of approaching this trope of this sacred fire. You know, the, the woman keeps it mother fire, grandmother fire. And in other cases, you know, different. But usually the hearth, this area, had to be kept clean of the ashes. The ashes were disposed in their own way. You know, kept away from all people and animals. Um... If this fire was not kept continuously, it would invite in illness, would invite in pestilence, malicious, bad spirit. Through Utana, through this central fire, was also a means to communicate with that deity, Utana, giving sacrificial food to the fire. Fire helps you make the food, right? Give some, too. Thank you. This fire was always representative of spiritual cleansing. And that's our kind of linchpin to understand 
the visions of Enoch or Ezekiel. The divinity is always accompanied by fire. That's cleansing. Cleansing. Reducing things to their essence. Freeing the spirit from the body. Fire. Spirit doesn't necessarily want to leave the body. <laughs> Fire. When it is a male form, there is Od Atta, or Od Khan, King of Fire, Fire Father, depicted as a red-colored man riding a goat. Moving on. Water. As previously mentioned, eldest sister to Earth. Earth began from water. From the bottom of the waters, the, heaven, the heavenly duck, right, lifted the sand, clay, silt. Earth created. It's one version. Water, though, is a double-edged sword. Water gave rise to hostile elements, possessors, spirits, bad spirits from other realms. Invites them in, brings them in. And this is interesting because of all the things, if our water here on this earth is not domestic, that has come from across the universe. And if we are to say that water inherits, mirrors and inherits what it has experienced, then that water coming here came here with baggage. And that baggage is a possessor of us. We take that in. We become that. We drink it. It becomes our blood. We inherit its baggage. And we have to, you know, expel or purify. Just, just, a, way, just a way of thinking. The productivity of the land and life, the crops, everything, though, coming from the beneficence of this water, plus and minus. Hostile towards fire. Hostile towards that deity. They can't get along. Very obvious. <laughs> of course they can't. <laughs> they can't both be in the same exact space. Bump shoulders, so to speak. So there's a, a bit of a contradictory attitude towards the waters, which is interesting, religiously speaking, because every religion would have something to say about the function of water, whether it's going to be a baptism or what have you, right? There's a ethic about what the water represents. And here, it's um, here and there. It's conflated. The earth, wife of Tengri, force of nature, human beings, appearing from mother, from this earth. People born, live, die on the earth. And after they're dead, the earth swallows them. There is a rising up and a going down. The earth is us. We are of its clay. These are the crops, assisted by water, of course, but the sustaining of our life and the material that gives us happiness, fulfillment, and contentment is of this earth. Gratitude. Gratitude towards that. Many ceremonies. Sacrifices. Milk. Tea. To the earth deity. Sacrificed. Now, when it comes to this three-tiered universe, you know, the upper world, the lower world, middle world, celestial world, underground, underworld, what have you, subterranean, connection of the tree, the tree of worlds in all, in all forms. This underworld was said at times by some to have nine layers. The celestial world was said to be 17 layers. So there are tiers, tiers to each of these. Shamans can travel to these realms with very few for forbiddance, very few. It's all about the means of which they would use to travel. S there are inhabitants to each of these realms. And sometimes these inhabitants of these other realms visit the earth. But they are invisible to people. But not to the shaman. The shaman knows the signs. Manifesting. Sometimes into the sizzling of the fire. 
This is, this is divinity through fire, divination. And sometimes in the bark of the trees, you can discern, discern presence. This early Khan, this um, bad brother, this bad other uh, from the earlier creation story, is the ruler of the underworld. Controls the souls of the underworld. So if a, uh, somebody is sick in the middle realm, then their spirit is being called towards the underworld. And a shaman can go to the underworld and work with Erlik on behalf of restoring this human, keeping them here. Tamag is a word used by the Turkic and Mongolian people in their mythology for this underworld. Hell is a tricky notion here because it's true. This is a place where criminals, against the ethic, people that, the, the people that people want to see suffer to pay for what they've done, are punished here. But that's justice. That's an idea of justice. This is just underground. And, and so karma is, is uh, satiated through this underground. And this deity is not necessarily good, but... They, it isn't quite this Lucifer kind of... Well, that, even that word, that's not a proper word. It isn't quite the antagonist, Satanas, as it's uh, understood. Described, Erlik, described as an old man with an athletic build. Eyes and eyebrows black as soot. Beard parted all the way to his knees. Mustache curling beyond his ears like tusks. Hair, curly, horns are like tree roots. Quite, 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 quite the depiction. The deepest place of the underworld is where Orlik resides with copper, a palace of copper, and furniture made of gold. And this is very Hades reminiscent. Hades' palace was filled with glorious gems. Of course, again, I'll say, where do all the gems come from? They come from the underworld. Not, not too hard to put that together. Erlik could send, has associations through his kin with epidemics and disasters. So when disasters happen, bubbled up from the underworld. People wouldn't say his name. They would give side names. Uh, so as to not speak the name directly, as to not conjure the name. The sons of Erlik, god of darkness, god of courage and bravery, god of chaos, god of evil, god of discord, god of informants, god of defeat, god of mining. Not all bad, but many bad. This is also reminiscent of Nyx, all the children of Nyx. They're not all bad. Many are bad, but it is a trope to acknowledge. Daughters could be two, or daughters were nine. It depends on who we're talking about. These names are unknown. Erlik, as it also has association with the aforementioned shamans, or kams. Mind you, kams, shaman, kams. Kams, kami, kami, like deity, or, you know, spirit for the Japanese. Kam. Related. With shamans. Shamans work with Erlik. Shamans also work with the heavens, though, as well. So, you know, they're travelers. That's, th that's their function. He doesn't cause evil, and he doesn't control people's soul, Erlik. But there is a source of these things from Erlik. The domain of evil spirits. And sometimes these evil spirits, not Erlik himself, but these evil spirits, ascend to harm people on the earth. It's personal. So usually if there were any sacrifices to be made to Erlik, this would be the sacrifice of an animal with some level of deformity and would be given at night, befittingly. Erlik is the god of death, as is usually associated with he who rules the underworld and is sometimes represented as a bear and sometimes represented as a human with a pig face, a grotesque pig face. Now, this story, too, is there, there is a story about the invention of death. 
that initially everything and people and animals were immortal, and that it became overpopulated. Thus, they invited death, they conjured death, they invented death. They, they brought it forth from the suggestion of a crow. And that's not the first time we've seen that. It's also true in Australia, if I remember correctly, the crow bringing death. So it was invited. People summoned Erlik, came forth, entered the universe. And first, you know, uh, this, this actually was horrible because then everybody knew they would die and they knew when they would die. So they were fearful all the time. And Tengri came and he hid, the, hid their dates. He hid the knowledge of their death. So you can see this function. So this uh, one kind of tie that is substantial between Erlik and the idea of Septonos or the antagonist would be this pride that led to the fall. This earlier creation story of him trying to fly higher than Tengri and falling into the waters falling from the heavens. But beyond that, it's tricky. And as I mentioned before, this could be syncretism because a number of these attributes could have been influenced by Zoroastrianism. And we know the neighboringness of these two beliefs. The Persians knew very well about Tengrism. And Zoroastrianism blossomed far. And so did Tengrism. So there could be some, this, this religion, again, is very open and is very synchronistic. So I'm going to say that I, I, I subscribe to that in the sense that I think this role of this ruler of the underworld inherited some of its beliefs from Zoroastrianism. And thus, when we see Abrahamic or Christianity or Islam and its duality, right, good, bad, up, down, that's Zoroastrianism too. So that is the source, I feel. Zoroastrianism is the source of both, both of these in different ways. The contrast of this is a certain form of Tengri, which is Ulgin. Ulgin is the name of a creator god, which is sometimes either going to be a form of Tengri, the same as Tengri, or something distinct from Tengri, yet metaphysically is the same as Tengri. <laughs> as Ulgin is the counter to Orlik, patron of shamans. Again, upper realm travel. Shamans go there too. Protector of humanity. Protector of all living beings. Protector of land. Protector of rainbow. Olgin has seven sons, just like Erlik did. His seven sons counter Erlik's seven sons. God of purity, God of horses, God of prosperity, God of birds, God of confidence, God of blessing, God of nature. He lives on the 16th floor of the sky. And remember, there's 17 floors of the sky. So we would imply through this version that Ulgin is one below Tengri proper. And only through very specific circumstances can shamans visit the 16th floor of the sky. A specific ceremony of a horse and a specific uh, white horse, I believe, um, needs to be orchestrated in order to facilitate the visionary journey into the 16th floor. So this heavenly world is very similar to the earth. The difference is that on the in the heavenly world, it is untouched nature. Every person, entity that lives there never deviated from the way. They never deviated from the ancestors and the traditions. They never deviated. There was no shortcoming. Utopia, certainly, would be an applicable word. Brighter than the earth. Brighter, more, more light. On some days, there are specific circumstances where this heavenly world opens up and the light shines through the clouds and comes to this world. And during this moment, the shamans know and the shamans make their prayers at these moments. 
make make do whatever they can in these moments because they're very special moments. Which takes, you know, uh, well, anyway, I'm going to move on. There are certain references to the multiple soul, which have been brought up before. And I'm giving one version of the multiple soul. And I bring this up for a few reasons, but you'll see why. So one of the three souls is outside of the body. This soul moves through the waters. Uh So it's part of the world, and it's outside of you, and it is your soul. And when a person dies, this soul moves back to the world tree. And when a person is reborn, it comes out of the world tree from the source and enters the newborn. So that one's the more abstract. Another part of the soul, another version, one of the three souls, is the soul of the self. And this is the personality. And this soul... Everything else fails, right? If you lose consciousness, if you lose function, if you die, then this soul will leave the body. But when it leaves, you're officially dead. This soul is of the earth. This resides in nature and will not be reborn. This will be taken by the earth and kept. And the third soul is a soul that provides body temperature and breathing. This is the cycle, the cycling soul. And this soul is what's missing from the inhabitants of the underworld. So the inhabitants of the underworld have the outside body soul, which moves through the water, time, and they have the personality soul. But the inhabitants of the underworld lack the body temperature and breathing. They are pale and their blood is black. And they don't receive the light or far less of the light. But there is believed to be settlements underground, forests, rivers underground that they inhabit. So in the closing through, I want to mention a few more things about the deities, as I've mentioned before. So there's your sub, the great deity, your, this is the visible world. This is the physical existence that we experience, your sub, your, the middle section of the universe, uniquely the middle section, beautiful, voluptuous woman depiction, the land and its waters, everything but mankind is subservient to her. All the animals, all the plants, completely reverent to her. Why is mankind different? Because Tengri gave the soul. The destiny of the world is given by Yur. The destiny has always been from the feminine to give. We've seen that throughout all ancient, ancient, ancient religions. This giving of human destiny is given by Earth. Of course, Tengri has allocated this. She will punish for wrongdoing. She does have the retributiveness about her, as the Mother Goddess always does. And she also has the benevolence, as the Mother Goddess always does. Sacrifices are made in the spring. And sacrifices are made after harvests on the caps of what the earth provides. Sacrifices, acknowledgement, thank you, is given on both ends, beginning and end. Horse, red color, horse, sacrificed for fertility, health. That was in the case of the Turks. After Well, I'm going to step back on that one. So, there is also Umai, female deity, benevolent deity, favorite wife of sky god Tengri. Like the earth, 
Umai always defers to Tengri. However, there is a unique power and abstract power to Umai. This is the vital life energy. This is chi, this is mana, this is consciousness, what have you. Umai is this energy, in and out. Every spiritual and physical happening of the universe is subject to the interplay of your sub and umai. So body and breath, or nature and spirit. Umai is sort of like the Holy Ghost, or, oh, there are several names I could go through. The Turks, the ancient Turks, mind you, it's always the case, dedicated meat and dairy, and were, uh, would offer solemn ceremonies, quiet ceremonies, to Umai. Considered the protector of pregnant women and small children, and protector against bad spirits. So that, I, I, I love that one. That one's fascinating in its abstraction. There's a few different leads. And, moving on, there's Atugan. And this is the condition, this is sort of like uh, an extension of the earth. In the sense that Atugan is like Persephone, where it is the abundance given to the land. So there is the greater mother and then there is the fledging mother or the fertility mother. And the fertility mother is this Atugan. And the condition of the trees would be the indication of how Atugan is experiencing mankind. If mankind is good and the trees that then the trees will look healthy. And if the trees look healthy, then harvest will come. And if badness, if the way is not being followed, Atugan will show the tree, trees will worsen, and then the people will know the prosperity will not be had. So this one is almost judicial, and a displaying of the judicial relationship between mankind and the universe. So what are we noticing here? There are many, 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 many more deities, many. Oh my gosh, there are many. But, and again, the 99 from before, uh, we certainly don't have all the names when it came to the Mongolians, at least. So I wanted to at least give those as a shout out. But what are we noticing here? There is a synchronistic relationship between the universe, uh, between nature in all of its facets, abstract, physical, otherwise, and the people. And this is much more wholesome. This feels much more like the animistic past. This feels much more connected. Yet, it is also offering ties to what is considered modern religion. Through, through this deification, we're seeing a lot of kind of odd interplay. But I also wanted to mention the kormos. And these are spirits and these kormos are ghosts, or demons, or uh, lingering spirits. However, these are just souls. And depending on where these souls come from, because these souls could be from the earth, or inhabiting the earth, these souls could be coming from the underground, or these souls could be coming from the sky and each with their own subsequent intentionality. For those that come from the sky, they are benevolent. These wandering souls protect and help humankind. These are almost angelic. And they come from the commands of one up high, Olgin or Tengri, what have you. They come to keep the balance, the temperance of the earth. Then there are those that come from the underground. And these are not good. We mentioned them before. These Kormosis are the uh, ones with ill intention. They come to abduct. They come to harm. They come to torture. They come with ill. In some cases, they come with their own volition, depending on uh, what, what, what belief system we're talking about. In other cases, they're coming directly as servants of relic. And lastly, there are those that just simply are not moving on. And they roam the earth. So these are earthbound spirits. And these Kormos are not good or bad, but they're just suffering. They're in a liminal state. So to kind of cap all this, this belief system is very debatable. There's so much more to go into. 
what do we, as I started with, how do we categorize this, right? Because the shamans have a function. We have a monotheistic creator, yet we also have an interplay with nature and all the things subsequently. The polytheism does not um, offend the monotheism. They both are true of their own volitions, and both can coexist simultaneously, which is fascinating. Now, when it comes to the formation of this belief system, it's pretty clear for us to say in all this explanation that I've shown is that this is a compilation of a diversity of different folk religions. This um, compilation only happens because of the substantiation of some sort of state or some sort of nation. Um, as it was mentioned before, you know, the Mongolian invasions in history was a centralized effort, right? And this centralized effort meant that you had to get all these people in on the same bag to do something like that, right? And this is Tengrism in the sense that enough people are getting together with enough of a mutual purpose that they assimilate. So this is a, a loose conglomeration because it isn't the Western codification that we've seen where it is hard, fast, strongly patriarchal, and, um, and damning of some capacity. That serves the function of that level of, of, of overpopulation. Whereas this is in the middle. This is in the middle between those things. And that's why it's in the middle between what we consider monotheism and what we consider animism. It is the syncretism. It's the middle of those things. And, and its differentiation from Siberian shamanism shows exactly that. Siberian shamanism is locale. It depends on that tribe and that tribe right there. And while there are commonalities, that is not what's being emphasized. Tengrism is a collection of commonality between Siberian shamanism. And so accordingly, the names variate and so forth and so forth, but this is the thread that you can find between all. We saw with the Ket people that they also had a run-in with monotheism. And so while these different tribes, certain ones had monotheism, other ones had polytheism, other ones were heavy lean animism, they all are represented here. And that's not an accident. And when we say shamanism, it's pretty tricky because that word was taken from anthropologists uh, or, you know, coined by anthropologists who took it from the region that we've been discussing, from Central Asian shamanism. Shaman. They took it from the Tungistic and the Samoyedic speaking people. And then this word used to describe their behaviors was patched all over the world, right? And so then the word got very uh, more ambiguous, let's just say. So what do we mean when we say shamanistic? The same as that of which is seen in Asia, or the same in Eurasia, or the same in America, right? Or anywhere across the world. Shamanism can be found anywhere. That word, it's tricky. It's a tricky thing. Anytime there is a uh, magic, or, you know. Well, anyway. So, the, the very definitions that we use to categorize religion, that is also something to point out at trying to pin, pin down this one, right? This specific set of beliefs that are not hard and fast. It's an approach, which that's all that this ever was. In the sense that religion only got born out of the idea of a certain approach of the world. A certain approach of what is death, what's going on, and what do I do about it. And this is an approach. And this approach is not authoritative in the sense that... As we saw, these laws are given, but you don't have to follow them because Tengri made mankind with shortcomings. The very fundamental circumstances of us was that there is shortcoming. So this isn't following you around like some dark shadow. This isn't oppressing you and making you feel guilt and shame. This approach is just that. It's acknowledgement, respect of the functions that are immediately observable in the universe, and a way of understanding where we came from and what we're doing and what we're on about. Personally, I love this study. 
there are countless leads to still go into. The fluid session that I've given was, again, acquaintance. But there's a lot more to be had when diving into the individual texts or diving into, say, the deer stones. <laughs> I've happened across plenty of leads yet to, yet to take, but... I hope you found this interesting and informative because I certainly did.